Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Viewer supported public television, WSKG TV, Binghamton. Squam Lake Science Center in Holderness, New Hampshire. Hi, my name is Louise McNamara. Many animals live here at the center, and lots of people come here to visit them and to learn things. There are some people now looking at something and talking about it. From time to time, we will see and hear groups like this one on the trails with us. We are going to be doing what they are doing walking around the center and learning about some of the animals by looking. We're going to be looking at some animals far away and at some animals up close. We'll look at big animals as large as a black bear and to little animals as small as a white-footed mouse. And some animals so small we will have to look through a microscope to see them, like these in a jar of pond water. Some things we will travel to see and some will be nearby. There's a word I'll be using a lot, habitat. An animal's habitat is its home. We will be visiting many different animal habitats. For example, we will visit Squam Lake, the lake that gave the Squam Lake Science Center its name. Squam Lake is the home of many fish. We will go to a forest habitat, the home of the porcupine, as well as many other animals you can think of. We will go to a field where you will see a kestrel. A kestrel is a kind of hawk. To a pond where you will see a crayfish and quite a few other animals too. To a marsh habitat where you will see a heron. And sometimes we'll go visit the nature hut right over here. And here, we'll look at some special animals that are otherwise hard to see in their natural habitat of the field, the forest, or the lake. We'll even turn over a rock, just to see for ourselves what animals live in this habitat. A habitat, remember, is a home for an animal. Do you think that you can see all the animals of the Squam Lake Science Center here at any time? No, you can't. And that's because some of the animals migrate when the weather turns cold. That is, they leave the Squam Lake Science Center and go to warmer places for the winter. Some birds and some butterflies do this. And some animals hibernate. That means they go underground and sleep most of the winter. A woodchuck, who's also called a groundhog, does this. The woodchuck doesn't leave its underground home until the weather turns warm again. We are going to visit many animals. But right now, I'd like you to meet Snowy Owl. When you look at Snowy Owl or any animal, I hope you'll do more than say, isn't that a beautiful animal? Or isn't it big? I'd like you to ask yourself questions about its color, its size, and its shape. I'd like you to think about what it eats, how it moves, how it protects itself. Was it born alive or hatched from an egg? These are all good questions. And here's another good question, a hard one. How are snowy owl and all other animals different from a rock? Well, let's see. Nod your head yes or no if you know any of the answers. Does a rock eat? Does it grow? Does a rock have babies? Can it move by itself? Does a rock die? Did you smile or nod your head no to all of those questions? Well, you were right if you did. 
Now, why can't a rock do any of those things? Because it's not what? It's not alive or living. Naturalists, those people who study plants and animals, have put everything in the world around us into two groups, living things and non-living things. All things that need food and water, that grow, that move around, and that have babies, belong to what group? The group of living things. What about rocks and other things that don't eat or move or grow or have babies? What group do they belong to? Non-living things, yes. And here's something else about living things that we didn't mention. Living things are born, they grow, and then something else happens. What is it? They die. All living things die. Non-living things, like this rock, don't die. Why? Of course, they can't die. They never were alive in the first place. But all living things die. That's the way it is. If you want to study living things that live in the water, you might like to have a net. I'll get my net. We'll go down to the pond and see what living things we can find there. By the way, after we've studied any living things we find, I'll let them go. You never want to keep living things away from their own habitat for too long. How many living things do you see? Do you see some weeds? Well, put up one finger if you do. Another finger if you see a frog. How about a turtle? Anybody see one of those? Okay, another finger. And what about some fish? And there are some damselflies. They're close relatives to dragonflies, you know. Dragonflies are a special favorite of mine. They remind me of a favorite poem of mine, written by an author I admire, Eleanor Fargen. When the heat of the summer made drowsy the land, a dragonfly came and sat on my hand. With its blue-jointed body and wings like spun glass, it lit on my fingers as though they were grass. Did you know there were dragonflies living on this earth when the dinosaurs were around? Scientists have found fossils that prove they were here. A fossil, you know, is a print that has hardened in mud or sand from a long time ago. A skeleton of an animal, or a footprint, or a leaf, perhaps. This is a fossil of a fish, millions of years old. From studying the fossils of dragonflies that lived on the Earth 300 million years ago, scientists know the dragonflies were much bigger then. How big were they? Well, stretch out your arm like this. Don't bump into anybody. And that's how big dragonflies were millions of years ago. All right, put your arm down again. And they couldn't fold their wings into their bodies any more than the adult dragonflies flying over this pond can fold theirs. These dragonflies are darting about over the water, laying their eggs as they fly. Hello, what have we got here? We're in luck. We've got a dragonfly nymph. Nymph, that's spelled N-Y-M-P-H. The young of many insects are called nymphs. Just by looking at it, what can you tell about it? Well, it's dark, like the bottom of the pond. It has how many legs? Six. Look closely for the wing buds. That's where the wings will appear on the adult dragonfly. Dragonflies and damselflies not only eat in midair, they can mate in midair too. That means they can join their bodies together to make more living things like themselves. You see it happening. After they mate, the female lays her eggs. They hatch into tiny insects, and if no other animal eats them, 
they turn into nymphs, like this one. I'm going to put the nymph in the jar of water, and let's take a look at it more closely when we get back to the nature hut. And on the way back, let's talk some more about the things we've learned today. All right? An animal's home is called its ha habitat, right. People who study plants and animals are called, do you remember? Naturalists. Everything around us is either a living thing or a non-living thing. Good. All living things eventually die. By the way, after we've studied any living things we find, I'll let them go. You never want to keep living things away from their own habitat for too long. Here we are. This is the nature hut. And now, let's take a closer look at the dragonfly nymph. This dragonfly nymph has a large mouth for catching other insects. It also has large specialized lenses in its eyes that help it see its food and escape from animals that would eat it. Before I take the nymph back to the pond where it belongs, I want you to take a look at a drop of pond water. I want you to be able to see all the living things that we couldn't see with our own eyes. The biggest animal you see swimming here is a paramecium. You say it, paramecium, good. A paramecium is a very simple animal, but like all living things, it needs food and water to stay alive. And like all other animals, it grows and moves around. Now I'm going to take the dragonfly nymph back to the pond. And what I would like you to do right now is look around the room that you're in and see how many living things you can find and how many non-living things. Living things first. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Next time on Spaceship Earth, the attack on the woodwork of Earth. Shown in red, man's work on the rainforests of then and now. From natural disaster to man at work, keeping an eye on the disappearing forests. Next time on Spaceship Earth. Tonight at 7 o'clock. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Viewer supported public television, WSKG TV, Binghamton. I'm doing? I'm digging for earthworms for my garden. Ah, here's one. Up 
Open it up. Don't worry. I won't hurt the earthworm. Look. Earthworms sometimes tie their own bodies in a knot like this. Robins can't do that. A mouse can't do that. You can't do that. Why not? Because you and many animals have something inside you that won't let you tie yourself in a knot. You have a backbone. Why don't you feel it? It's easy to do. Just put your hand in the center of your back and run your fingers up and down. That's your backbone. An earthworm has no backbone. It has no skeleton. It has no bones at all. Naturalists, people who study plants and animals, divide animals into two groups. Animals with backbones, animals without backbones. Animals with backbones, like snakes and frogs and raccoons, are called vertebrates. Animals without backbones, like caterpillars and tarantulas and other spiders, are called invertebrates. In means not. So, an earthworm is a what? An invertebrate. Right. There are thousands of different kinds of worms on this earth. Many of them are earthworms, like the ones I'm collecting. Even earthworms come in different sizes and different colors, but most of them are alike in many ways. Sometimes animals are alike because of what they don't have. Worms don't have legs. And because an earthworm doesn't have any legs, it needs something else. It needs muscles to help it move. Our earthworm may look slippery and smooth, but it has bristles on the underside of its body. The bristles are like stiff hairs. They help the earthworm cling to the earth as it crawls along. They also help it cling to the sides of its hole in the ground if a robin comes along and tries to take it away. Notice the many rings on the body of this earthworm. The rings show us where the earthworm's muscles are. An earthworm moves by stretching and squeezing its muscles like this. How do I know where to dig for earthworms? Well, this wiggly shaped stuff on the ground gives me a clue. What is it? Where did it come from? It is earthworm droppings. It comes from the earthworm's body. Let me explain. An earthworm lives in a burrow. A burrow is a long hole or a tunnel that the earthworm makes for itself down in the soil. If the earth is soft, as it is in this bucket, then the earthworm makes a burrow by pushing the earth aside with the front end, the point of its head, and crawling down inside. But usually an earthworm makes a burrow by swallowing the soil. There are bits of plants and leaves in the soil, and this is the earthworm's food. This is what the earthworm eats, and this is the way the earthworm eats. It takes in food through its mouth at the front end of its body. The earthworm digests or uses this food in the soil as it passes through its body, and then it passes out the other end of its body as waste, or earthworm droppings. The waste, these clumps of things on the ground, are called castings. Whenever you see castings on top of the ground, you know there are earthworms under the ground. I know another place to find some worms. Let's go there. I have to dig carefully, and I have to dig quickly. An earthworm might just slide down into its burrow when it hears the crunching trot sound that my trowel makes in the earth. What? An earthworm can hear? An earthworm has ears? <laughs> of course, not the kind of ears that you and many other animals have. Not ears that you can see. 
But an earthworm has a special place on its body that enables it to hear other animals moving around. An earthworm uses its special sense to hide from its predators. Predators? That's a special word I'll be using a lot from now on. An animal's predators are other animals that eat it for food. What animals eat earthworms? Let's see if you know what an earthworm's predators are. Yes, birds, snakes, turtles, toads, frogs. Oh, and quite a few others I'm sure you can think of. With so many predators, how does an earthworm survive? How is it that there are so many earthworms in the soil? It's probably because there are so many baby earthworms that are hatched every year. Like all animals, earthworms are able to make more animals like themselves. How does an earthworm make more earthworms like itself? Well, earthworms mate at night and make eggs that will hatch in the soil into baby worms. Sometime when you dig in the soil, you might find some of these baby worms. They look like their parents, except they are white and smaller. Are earthworms useful animals? Do we need them? Yes, we do. Earthworms are very important to people who have gardens. Earthworm castings, those droppings that we saw earlier, help fertilize or feed the soil and make the plants grow better. Also, earthworms, by making burrows, make spaces in the soil that let air and water reach down to the roots of the plants. Plant roots need air and water to help them grow. Earthworms are important to other animals, too. Many animals would have a hard time finding food for their young if there were no earthworms around. The invertebrate I'm going to talk about next frightened Miss Muppet away, a spider. A few spiders can be dangerous to people, so it's all right to look at them, but don't pick them up. How do I know this is a spider? I know it's a spider by the number of legs it has. Why don't you count them with me? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Besides having eight legs, many spiders have eight eyes. And under their eyes, they have two fangs to paralyze the animals they catch to eat. The animals they catch are called their prey, P-R-E-Y. A fly is often a spider's prey. Like all spiders, this spider's body has two main parts. One is the head, the big back part that looks like a bean is the other. What do you think of when you think of spiders? Webs? Spiders spin webs everywhere they live. Inside buildings, outside in the woods, in fields, in trees, in bushes, and grass, and in holes they dig in the ground. Different kinds of spiders spin different kinds of webs. Some spiders spin a web to catch their food, their prey. The spider that spun this web caught a fly. A spider spins a web from the silk that it forms in its body. A spider web is sticky. A spider web is strong. And once an insect flies into it, it seldom gets out. Many spiders lay eggs in webs, too. A spider web with an egg case in it may look like this. But all spiders don't lay eggs in webs. Some carry their eggs around with them until they hatch. Then they carry their babies or spiderlings on their backs until the babies are big enough to take care of themselves. Here's a spider that lives in holes in the ground in the southwestern part of our country. This large spider with its eight eyes all crowded together on the top of its head is a tarantula. It could easily win a prize for its scary appearance, but like most spiders, it usually is not harmful to people. A tarantula does not catch its prey in a web. It captures it by grabbing it as it goes by. Now, an earthworm doesn't look like a spider. 
But both earthworms and spiders can do something that very few other animals can do. If an earthworm loses a small piece of its head or its tail, it can grow a new one. And if a young spider loses a leg, it can grow a new one too. <laughs> That's something we humans can't do. Let's review what we have talked about today. Naturalists divide animals into two groups, vertebrates and invertebrates. Earthworms and spiders are invertebrates. An earthworm's home is called a burrow. An animal that eats another animal for food is called a predator. A spider has how many legs? Eight. And a spider's body has how many parts? Two. Good for you. There are many other invertebrates living on this earth, too. They come in many sizes, and they live in many places. Some live in freshwater. Crayfish, sometimes called crawfish or crawdads, are freshwater invertebrates. Some live in the ocean, like lobsters, starfish, crabs, and clams. Some invertebrates fly, buzz, flutter, and crawl all around us. Do you know what they are? Insects, yes. Next time, we're going to talk about them. Why don't you make a list of all the insects you know? Here's a clue. An insect is an animal with six legs. See you next time. program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Today's schedule? Talk to a computer screen the size of your office wall. Test drive a prototype without the expense of building it. We're 10 years into a 30-year period that will reshape our, our society, our globe, as profoundly as the Industrial Revolution. Innovation looks at things to come when taking care of business. Part one of The Future is Now. Tonight at 10 o'clock. Host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Supported Public Television, WSKG TV, Binghamton. there are more insects in this world than there are people or any other animals. There are millions of insects in the trees, in the grass, in the air, in the water, and I think that all of them are here right this minute. How many of you made that list of insects that we talked about last time? You did? Oh, good. This may sound like a silly question, but how do you know an insect is an insect? All insects don't look alike, of course not. But they are alike in many ways. Did you ever see an insect that looked like this one? Probably not. A friend gave this one to me as a joke. But it does look like a fly, right. And a fly is an insect. 
How many legs does it have? Why don't you count them? One, two, three, four, five, six. All adult insects have six legs. Now a fly is an insect, but a spider isn't. How many legs does a spider have? Eight, right. And an earthworm isn't an insect either. How many legs does an earthworm have? None. But one way that flies, spiders, and earthworms are alike is that they all belong to that group of animals without backbones that we talked about last time. These animals are called in invertebrates. Another way insects are alike is that all adult insects have three body parts, a head, a middle part called the thorax, and an abdomen. I'll point out the three parts and you say the names. Good. Six legs and three body parts. That's what makes an insect an insect. Can you think of anything else an insect has? What about wings? Well, some do and some don't have wings. A fly, for instance, has one pair of wings. The wings are attached to the thorax. Aphids and some other insects that you can probably think of don't have wings. Aphids suck the sap from the leaves and stems of plants and can do a lot of damage. Most adult insects have wings and most adult insects can fly. A fly has only one pair of wings. Many insects, like this leaf beetle, have two pair. The second pair often covers the first pair and protects them like a shell. Now, in addition to the six legs and the three parts, head, thorax, abdomen, and the wings, which are attached to the thorax, insects also have wire-like things on their heads for feeling and for smelling. They're called antennae. You say it, antennae. Some people call them feelers because an insect does use its antennae, its feelers, to feel the air and other things around it. Do you think insects are beautiful? What about butterflies? Butterflies are insects, like the monarch butterfly, for instance. Some people say that if you wish on the first butterfly you see in the summer, your wish will come true. Where do these insects come from? Well, the monarch butterfly, like all butterflies, comes from an egg that the female butterfly lays. Butterflies lay their eggs on plants that their young will use for food when they hatch. The monarch butterfly always lays her eggs on a milkweed plant. Her young will not eat anything else. What hatches out of the egg the butterfly lays doesn't look the least bit like a butterfly. It looks like a worm or a caterpillar. It has a special name. It is called a larva. You say it. Good. This larva or caterpillar eats and eats and grows and grows. It sheds its skin as it grows. When an animal sheds its skin, we say it is molting. When the larva sheds its skin for the last time, it becomes covered with a strangely shaped case of hard skin. It has no eyes, wings, mouth, antennae, or legs. But the body parts of a butterfly can be seen forming. It is now called a pupa. The monarch butterfly's pupa is pale green with a gold-colored band and with gold-colored dots on it. After a few weeks, an adult butterfly comes out of the pupa. It dries its wet, crumpled wings in the air and flies away. Now, there are four stages to the birth of a butterfly or a moth. Why don't you say them with me? First, there's the egg then the larva or caterpillar, pupa, and adult. Good. This exciting change from an egg to a flying butterfly is called metamorphosis. That's a really big word, I know. I just thought you might like to know what it means when you hear it being used. It means changing from one thing to another. Look at all these bees flying around this field of flowers. What do you think they're doing? Eating. 
All things eat to stay alive. And bees live on the nectar or the sweet juices that the flowers make. Do you think insects are bad? To think of any living thing as bad is not right. Insects are part of nature, and in some way, every part of nature is valuable. Some insects are helpful, however, and some are not. For example, the larva or caterpillar stage of some butterflies and moths can do harm to the leaves of trees and plants. The larvae can even kill trees and plants. The larvae of the white cabbage butterfly destroy lettuce and cabbage plants in the farmer's garden. And some of you already know what the gypsy moth can do to whole forests. We think of the gypsy moth as a pest. They are pests to us, but remember, they are only trying to stay alive. Let's see. So far, we have seen that some insects go through four stages as they grow. There's another way. Grasshoppers, for instance, look almost like their parents from the time they are hatched. They never do go through the four stages. Baby grasshoppers are called nymphs. They do not have wings as their parents do, and they are different in other ways, too. But by the time they molt several times, they look exactly like their parents. There are millions of insects in the world and many interesting things to learn about them. One of the best ways to learn about insects is to collect a few and study them. That's what I have done. Let's go to the nature hut now because I have some insects I've collected that I'd like to show you before I let them go. Here's my cricket cage with a cricket in it. Grasshoppers and crickets make good pets for a few days. They're easy to feed. They eat almost any kind of vegetable. You have to be sure to give them water. And after a few days, you should always take them back to the field where you found them. In China and Japan, people like to hang little cricket cages in their houses because they like to hear the chirping sounds all the time. Crickets make a chirping kind of music by scraping their front wings together. You've probably heard them chirping outside in the warm summer months. I like the sound of crickets when I'm working here in the nature hut at night. And here are some baby praying mantises that hatched out several days ago. See how tiny they are? A praying mantis might look as if it's saying its prayers, but what it is really doing is holding up its front legs, ready to grab the first tiny insect that comes its way. The baby praying mantis doesn't go through four stages to become an adult. When it breaks out of its egg case, it is a tiny copy of its parents. Have you ever seen one of these? It's the egg case of a praying mantis. The female praying mantis lays her eggs in a bag of foam that hardens and protects them until they hatch. Some farmers buy these egg cases from garden supply stores and put them in their gardens because the grown mantis will eat almost any insect that comes its way, including insects that we consider pests. The praying mantis is the only insect that can turn its head all the way around and see in all directions. That and the sharp spikes on its long front legs make it easy for the praying mantis to grab its prey and eat it. It's not always easy to see an insect. An insect sitting on a green leaf or twig is not easy to see, especially if the insect looks like a leaf or a twig. This ability of an animal to hide itself because of its shape or color, and even its ability to change its color, is called camouflage. This jar has fireflies in it. The firefly gives off a cold light. It doesn't do this to light its way in the dark, but to attract other fireflies for mating. You can pick a firefly up. It won't burn your hand. In the daytime, fireflies are dull-looking animals. But I think everyone enjoys watching the bright lights they make in the trees and bushes on a summer night. And here's our ant farm. Ants and bees and some wasps are social insects. That means they live in small groups called colonies and work together to build their nests, get their food, and defend themselves. Notice the ant tunnels and the special rooms. 
The queen ant does nothing but lay eggs. The other ants, called workers, take care of her and the eggs. Now, let's see, what have we learned today? How many legs does an insect have? Six, right. What are the three main parts of an insect's body? Head, thorax, abdomen, good. Some insects have one pair of wings, but most insects have two. What part of the insect's body are the wings attached to? The thorax. For feeling and for smelling, an insect uses its antennae. And what does this word mean? Metamorphosis? It means changing from one thing to another. Now here's another big word for you, entomologist. An entomologist is a scientist who studies insects. Maybe you'd like to pretend that you're an entomologist and pick one insect to learn everything you can about by watching, thinking, asking questions. Maybe you can find out something about your insect that nobody ever knew before. It's possible, really. So good luck and see you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Next time on NOVA, at the end of the war, the Iraqis retreat, leaving Kuwait in flames. With countless oil fires burning out of control, firefighters from the U.S. and around the world face the ultimate challenge. Equipment is scarce, organization poor, and it is up to them to save Kuwait and the world from environmental catastrophe. The new front lines are manned by the hell fighters of... Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Supported Public Television, WSKG TV, Binghamton. that live there too. Like this fish, it's a trout. A rainy day like this is a good day for catching trout. Let's take a look at this fish and see how it is different from other animals we have talked about. A fish cannot live very long out of water. It cannot breathe as we do. It does need oxygen just as we do, but it must take its oxygen from the water. The fish's gills collect the oxygen from the water. The fish takes the water through its mouth and breathes it out through its gills, right here. A fish can see in all directions, but it can't close its eyes. It has no eyelids. The water keeps a fish's eyes clean and healthy. Does a fish have a backbone? Yes, it does, right here. It belongs to the group of animals called vertebrates. A fish has fins instead of legs, and it is cold-blooded. A cold-blooded animal is one whose body temperature becomes warm or cold as the air or water around it becomes warm or cold. 
You're not cold-blooded. You're warm-blooded. Your body temperature stays the same, unless you're sick and you have a fever, or you stay out in the cold too long and you get frostbite. Unlike some other cold-blooded animals that you'll meet later, frogs, turtles, and snakes, for example, a fish can't sit in the sun to get warm, so it swims to warmer parts of the lake or river or pond when the weather gets cold. Scales, these small pieces of hard skin that overlap, give a fish its color and protect its body from disease. Most fish have scales, the trout does, but here's another one that doesn't. Ah. Ooh. You have to be careful when you're picking up a catfish or a horned pout as it's called. Catfish have long feelers on their faces. These things that look like cat whiskers are called feelers. The feelers won't hurt my hand, but the sharp barbs on their fins will. Catfish can use these barbs to sting a predator. Trout and catfish aren't the only fish that live in Squam Lake. After I put these back in the water, I'd like to show you some others. In nearly every pond or lake that you visit, one of the first fish you'll see are minnows. The minnow family is the largest of all families of fish. Some minnows are quite small, but they're not baby fish, as you might think when you first see them. Some minnows have funny names. They're called chubs and dace and shiners. My grandfather used to call minnows mummy chugs. When I was little, I thought he made that name up, but he didn't. Some people do call them mummy chugs. In Indian language, that means travel in a crowd. And here's another fish that you can usually find almost anywhere. It's a sunfish. And some people call it a pumpkin seed. It's shaped like a pumpkin seed, thin on the sides and plump in the middle. I'm going to put all these fish back in the water right now. They need air. And the sunfish needs to get back and protect his eggs. Ah, oh, my hands are a mess. They're covered with slime. Most fish are slimy. The slime helps them move through the water more easily, and it also protects their scales. You know, there are a lot of different things to learn about fish, and there are a lot of fish to learn things about. If you want to see lots of different kinds of fish, one of the best ways to do that is to visit a large aquarium, like the New England Aquarium in Boston. At the aquarium, we'll be looking at saltwater fish, the kind that live in the ocean. Other animals live in this giant tank besides fish. Sea turtles, for example. Look at those flippers. Sea turtles and seals and walruses all have flippers to help them move. Some of the fish are so big they're almost scary. And some are so tiny you have to look carefully to see them. When you look at any of these fish, I want you to notice several things. First of all, I want you to notice its size and shape. Fish grow to different size. Fish come in different shapes. This is a flounder. This fish lives mostly on the bottom of the ocean. Nod your head if you think its eyes are in a good place. It couldn't see too well if they were on the side of its head, could it? There's a fish that has sharp things sticking out all over it. A big fish would have to be very hungry to swallow a fish like that. This fish is a porcupine fish, and its sharp barbs help keep predators away. Ooh, look at that fish with the long nose and teeth like a saw. This is a sawfish. Those teeth help protect it from bigger fish. 
And there's one that looks like an alligator. Like most fish, this fish's body is covered with scales. It's called an alligator gar. Oh, do you see a fish that looks like a kite? This oddly shaped fish is called a skate. Now, find a fish that looks like a rock. What a great camouflage. It's hard to know which is a fish and which is a rock. You can usually tell one fish from another by its size and its shape and color, but not always. Look at these two. They're almost the same size and they both have the same shape. What's different? Look closely. They're fins. Almost all fish have fins. Tail fins, top fins, bottom fins, and side fins, sometimes called arm fins. The fins of all fish aren't alike. Some are split in the middle. Some look like sails. And some look like wings. And some hang down like skinny legs. You can usually tell one fish from another by looking at its fins. Fish need their fins. Let's see if we can see how they use them. Fish use their fins, especially their tail fins, to turn in the water and to push themselves forward. They use their fins to stop. They use their fins to stay in one place. Notice how this fish moves its arm fin just a little to stay in place. A group of fish swimming together is called a school. Nobody knows for sure why some kinds of fish swim in schools. Some naturalists say they do it for protection. Predators are confused by so many fish and can't easily pick out one fish to attack. Maybe one day, one of you will discover the real reason why fish travel in schools. Fish travel? Yes, some of them really do. Once a year, alewives, which are also called herring, and other fish like eels and salmon migrate. They leave their homes and go back to where they were born to spawn. Spawn means to lay eggs. Alewives leave the ocean and make their way up rivers and streams, over rocks, against strong swift water, leaping and falling back until they reach the special pond or brook where they were hatched several years earlier. Birds catch many of them, and people do too. But those that survive spawn and then make their return journey to the ocean. Now, here are a few questions about what we have learned today. Is it fish cold-blooded or warm-blooded? Cold-blooded, right. Is a fish a vertebrate or an invertebrate? Yes, a vertebrate. It does have a backbone. A fish takes water and air in through its mouth and out through its gills. Oh, good for you. And finally, to stop, turn, or stay in one place, a fish uses its fins. Excellent. Well, next time, we're going to talk about a group of animals that spend part of their time on the land and part of their lives in the water frogs, toads, and salamanders. See you then. has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.
Greenfield Village. Read together with Walter Anderson. Did you ever hear the expression as slippery as a fish? If you didn't, watch out. A cold, wet fish can go flying right out of your hands to who knows where. <laughs> Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Viewer supported public television, WSKG TV Binghamton. stand, he sit almost. When he hop, he fly almost. He ain't got no sense hardly. He ain't got no tail hardly either. When he sit, he sit on what he ain't got almost. That's a very old and very silly poem. When we were six, my friend Charlie and I used to think it was so funny. Of course, we knew that a frog couldn't fly. We knew a frog wasn't a bird. We knew a frog had all the sense it needed to be a frog. And we knew that a frog didn't have a tail. But what we didn't know when we were six was that a frog does have a tail before it becomes a frog. I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. First, this is a bullfrog. One thing I can tell you for sure is that he's very slippery. What do you notice about him? Green? Yes, his color is green. He's green and speckled and whitish. Lightish colored below. Two bulging eyes sitting high on his head. A big mouth for catching insects. Yes, you can see his throat going in and out, can't you? That's where he makes that big bullfrog croaking sound. Maybe you can even see his nostrils going in and out where he's breathing air. Can you see? What else? Do you see these circles on his head behind his eyes? Those are his eardrums. That's where the frog can hear. And what do we see on his front foot? Four toes. No webs between his toes on his front foot. There are webs on his back feet, as we'll see later. The bullfrog is the biggest frog in the United States. Bullfrogs and all frogs belong to the group of animals called amphibians. Amphibian, that's a new word. Why don't you say it? Amphibian, good. Salamanders and toads are amphibians too. The word amphibian means having a double life. An amphibian has a double life because it spends part of its time on land and part of its life in the water. I think we need some more words to describe an amphibian. Let's see. How about this? An amphibian lays its eggs in the water and it spends the early part of its life in the water. And it's also true that an amphibian doesn't have any hair, fur, feathers, or scales. It's hard to believe that the bullfrog we just saw was once a tiny black dot surrounded by jelly. Let's see what a frog's egg looks like. This is a display of frog's eggs. They're not alive. A frog's egg starts as a single cell. This single cell divides and divides adding more cells and growing bigger. The black part in the egg 
grows into a frog. Every animal needs food in order to grow, even before it is born. Frogs do. Dogs do. You did, too. Frogs' eggs usually start in large clumps called egg masses. You can get a pretty good idea of what the frog's egg mass looks like by looking at these pictures of an egg mass of another amphibian, a salamander. Salamander's eggs are a bit larger than frog's eggs, but they do start out in an egg mass, just as a frog's eggs do. Toad's eggs start out differently. They look more like a string of beads. Frog's eggs, those black dots we saw, will use their food and grow until they are big enough to break out of the jelly that protects them and swim around by themselves. When that happens, we call them tadpoles or polywogs. A few days ago, when they came out of the eggs, each tadpole was a tiny flat animal with no eyes, no mouth, no nose, or legs. All it could do was stick to a plant or something nearby. It did this by using a tiny sucker that had grown under its head. Now these tadpoles have grown to look like small fish. If you look closely, you'll see that they have eyes and a mouth, and they breathe through gills, those feathery things. Notice how they use their tails to swim through the water. The first sign that a tadpole won't be a tadpole much longer comes when hind legs appear. As these tadpoles get older, front legs will appear right next to their gills. During the time while the legs are growing on these tadpoles, their tails will get smaller and smaller until they disappear. What happens to the tadpole's tail? Does it drop off? Well, it's not easy to explain. But little by little, the tadpole's tail disappears into its body. Naturalists tell us that as this is happening, an amphibian does not need to eat for a while. It can live on the food that is stored in its own tail, just as people can burn up the fat that is in their own bodies when they diet. A full-grown frog might look like a bullfrog right here. <laughs> Many people think frogs and toads look alike. Do you? Well, you know what a frog looks like. Let's go down near the pond and see what a toad looks like. Okay? What do we have here? A toad, right. Does it look like a frog? Well, in some ways it does. But there is one way you can tell a toad is a toad. Do you remember that the frog had smooth, slippery skin? The toad has bumpy, warty skin. But you don't need to worry. Toads won't give you warts. That's an old story, and it's not true. Toads live most of their lives on land, so they do not have webbed feet. But many animals that live in or near the water do have webbed feet. Ducks do. Beavers do. Some turtles do. And frogs do, too. Let's see if I can show you this fellow's webbed foot. You can see the webbed feet right here. They're different from the toad's feet, aren't they? Frogs are also different from toads in that their legs are longer and stronger. And frogs can jump farther than toads. Let's see. Now, let's see that again in slow motion. Toads don't jump as far as frogs do. Toads hop. See? What does a toad or frog eat? A frog or toad will eat anything small enough that flies, swims, or wiggles in front of its face. A tadpole will eat plants and dead animals, but a frog or a toad will not eat anything that isn't moving, anything that isn't alive. A frog could starve to death sitting right in front of a bowl of dead bugs.
A frog has a long, sticky tongue hitched at the front of its mouth. It sits and waits until an insect goes by its nose, and then, quick as a wink, the frog's sticky tongue flips out and catches it, just like this. Only so fast, you might not see it happen. In the same way, the frog uses its tongue to catch its dinner. So far, we've talked about frogs and toads. Let's take a look at another amphibian, a salamander. This is a red-back salamander. A salamander spends much of its life living under logs and wet leaves. On rainy nights, the salamander comes out to look for insects to eat. Because a salamander's skin is very sensitive, I'm trying not to let it touch my skin. Frogs, toads, and salamanders are fun to look at and to talk about. I have some others back at the nature hut that I'd like to show you before I let them go. So let's go look at them now. This is a green frog. That's not just its color, it's its name, too. Green frogs grow to be about three or four inches in length in body size. Throughout their life, they live near a pool, a pond, or a lake. This is a pickerel frog. It's found in streams and ponds and grassy places. It's a small brown frog with dark rectangular spots. This is a tree frog. It has sticky pads on its toes to help it climb and jump along the branches of trees. If you live near a pond, in the spring you may see some tree frogs clinging to your window panes. And you'll certainly hear the trilling sound they make. And this is a wood frog. It lives in the woods. It's certainly well camouflaged, isn't it? Wood frogs can change from light brown to dark brown in color. It all depends on what color they're on. This interesting amphibian is called a red eft. It begins its life in the water, as all amphibians do. It usually spends two or three years in the damp woods. If you look closely, you can see tiny red spots on its bright orange body. When the red eft goes back to the water to live, it turns a dark color, but it keeps its red spots and it has a new name. It's called a newt. Well, let's see. Before I take the animals back to the pond, let's review some of the interesting things that we've learned about them. Frogs, toads, and salamanders belong to what group of animals? Amphibians, right. Amphibians lay their eggs in, in the water, or in the pond, fine. Like fish, tadpoles breathe through gills. Many amphibians have what kind of feet? Webbed, right. Okay, that's all we have time for today. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Read Together with Walter Anderson. Do you know someone who likes to tell stories? Is there a person in your family who always has an adventure to talk about? Fun, isn't it? Especially when the adventures are a little bit out of this world. In a book called My Father's Dragon, I read an amazing story about a wild island where dragons live and animals talk. It's a really funny, very tall tale. There's gum-chewing tigers, a lion with hair ribbons, a baby dragon, and a boy named Elmer Elevator. Elmer's a clever fellow.
Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Viewer supported public television, WSKG TV Binghamton. turtle while walking through the science center this morning. It's a painted turtle. Can you see how it got its name? It looks as if someone had painted the head, the legs, and the shell, doesn't it? Actually, that's its natural color. Where do painted turtles live? What is their habitat? There's that word again. A habitat is the place where an animal lives, right? Well, where do turtles live? Around ponds? lakes, swamps, right. All three places are habitats for turtles. Since the weather's turning cold, maybe our turtle was on its way down to the pond to hibernate under the mud. Or maybe it was just looking for something to eat. Unlike other turtles, painted turtles cannot swallow their food unless they're underwater. They eat fish, tadpoles, worms, insects, things like that. The way a turtle moves is different from the way any other animal moves. Why is it different? Is it because the turtle has to carry a shell on its back? Yes, that's one reason. And there's another reason which we'll talk about later. Right now, we'll put our painted turtle back in the basket. Later, I'll take it back where I found it. You should always take animals back where you find them. What is a turtle anyway? How do you know one when you see one? Well, let's look at another turtle to find out. What's the first thing you notice about a turtle? It has what? A shell, yes. The painted turtle has a shell, and this turtle has a shell. This one is called a box turtle. Do I call it that because I just took it out of a box? No, it gets its name from the fact that it can close itself up like a box. A turtle is a reptile, R-E-P-T-I-L-E. -E. That's a word I want you to remember. The turtle belongs to the group of animals called reptiles, and so do snakes, lizards, alligators, and crocodiles. They are all cold-blooded, they lay tough-shelled eggs on land, and they have dry, scaly skin. The only reptile that has a shell is the turtle. A turtle shell is made of two parts. The top part, this part shaped like a helmet, is called the carapace. You say it. The bottom part is called the plastron. Go ahead. The carapace and plastron of most turtles are fastened together by bony bridges that hold the top and the bottom together. The box turtle is different in one special way. It has a hinge right here on its plastron. This hinge makes it possible for the box turtle to pull the plastron up against the carapace. He can pull in his head, his tail, and four feet. This turtle can close up like a box. That is, most of the time he can close up like this. But sometimes he eats too many wild strawberries or mushrooms and gets so fat he can't close his shell at all. I said he. I know this is a male box turtle because it has red eyes. Male box turtles usually have red eyes. Female box turtles have brown ones. Brown eyes or red eyes. Turtles have good eyesight. Do you think turtles can hear? Well, they do seem to have special parts right about here and here. And many scientists think these special parts let a turtle hear. And what else does a turtle have? It has a tail and four feet. What does a turtle need a tail for? Watch. 
Sometimes he uses his tail to turn over. <laughs> this time he used his head. Now let's take a look at its feet. Fox turtles have five toes on their front feet and four toes on their back feet. Pond turtles, like this painted turtle, have webs between their toes. The webs help them to swim. The box turtle doesn't have webs. It lives in the woods. Not all turtles live in wet places. Do you think a turtle has teeth? No, it doesn't. Then why do I hold it so carefully? Because it can bite. It has hard, bony ridges in its mouth for snatching and holding its food and for biting your finger. Does a turtle have a nose? Yes, look at these two openings right here. A turtle needs a good sense of smell to help it find its food. And what about the turtle's skin? Like all reptiles, it has dry, scaly skin. But the scales on the turtle's feet and head are not as hard and bony as the ones on its back. These hard scales are called plates or scoots. Scoots, that's spelled S-C-U-T-E-S. -E you say it. Good. These scoots are made of hard, bony material like your fingernails are made out of. Well, now let's let the box turtle go. Now that's what a turtle is like on the outside. What is a turtle like on the inside? Let's go inside the nature hut and find out. This is the skeleton of a snapping turtle. As you can see, the turtle grows most of its skeleton on the outside of its body, right there on the shell. Like many other animals, the turtle has a backbone. It belongs to the group of animals called vertebrates. And it has tail bones, hip bones, leg bones, back bone, rib bones, shoulder bones, neck bones, head bones, just like the song says. Let's take a closer look at the leg bones, because right there, there's another reason why a turtle's walk is so different. The turtle's leg bones are fastened to its ribs. Its heavy shell is like a suit of armor, and the way its bones are fastened right here, slow the turtle down some more. But the turtle gets where it's going just the same. Do you remember the story of the tortoise and the hare? A turtle's neck bones are put together in such a way that it can move its head in all directions. It can stretch out its neck to grab for food, and it can pull it in to hide from enemies. It can turn its head left, right, up, and down. Do you remember how the box turtle stretched its neck and used its head to turn over? And when a turtle pulls its neck into its shell, it folds it back in an S curve and tucks it in here, like this. Let's take a look at the turtle's skull. The turtle has a small skull and a small brain inside. Turtles are slow, but that doesn't mean they aren't smart. Some scientists say that the turtle is the smartest of the reptiles. We know a turtle is smart enough to do what turtles need to do to stay alive. Turtles have been around for a long time. Fossils have been found that prove turtles were here on this earth when the dinosaurs were here, over 200 million years ago. The dinosaurs, the great reptiles, disappeared. Turtles, the small reptiles, stayed on. People have liked turtles for a long time. For example, one of the early Greek coins had the design of a turtle on it. Now, here's some interesting things I'd like to show you. Here we have a ceramic planter of a turtle and a mahogany turtle from the Philippines. This is a marble turtle from Mexico. One thing this shows us is that turtles are found almost everywhere. Here's a little leather turtle on a necklace and a clay pottery turtle. And we have a silver necklace made of turquoise and coral and another one with tiger's eye inside. And this is a silver dish shaped like a turtle that once belonged to my grandmother. 
Sometime, why don't you try counting the many things that you see that have turtle designs? What's this doing here? Here's something that wasn't made to look like a turtle. These were made by a turtle. Do you know what they are? They're turtle eggs. They're hard and tough and leathery. It must be quite difficult for a baby turtle to get out of the egg. But like chickens, when they are born, a baby turtle has a beak called an egg tooth that helps it to break open the shell. These baby turtles will never see their mother. Once they are born, they are on their own. They have to find a place to live and something to eat all by themselves. Here's something else I want to show you. This baby snapping turtle was found hiding under a rock, hissing and striking out at everything that came near it. It was the only one left from a hatching of about 20 snapping turtles. A flock of crows got all the others as they were leaving the nest and going to the pond. Everything must eat to stay alive. Crows sometimes eat baby snapping turtles. Hawks sometimes eat crows. I'll pick this baby snapping turtle up very carefully. Small as it is, this turtle could bite my finger. Oh, can you see the webbed feet? What does that tell us? I'll put the baby snapper in the basket with the painted turtle. And we'll take them both down to the pond. OK, let's go. painted turtle down right here. Maybe the sun will come out later. Turtles like to sit in the sun a lot. Do you suppose that's because the sun feels so good on their bodies? Yes, that's probably true. And there's another reason, too. Turtles have many bones in their bodies. And they need the same things you do in order to make their bones grow and be strong. One necessary thing is vitamin D. They get vitamin D from the sun. Hello, we're in luck. There's an adult snapping turtle. How did I know that the baby turtle I found was a snapping turtle? Well, that's easy, because it looks like the adult snapping turtle. Not all baby animals look like their parents, but turtles do. You know, in some people's minds, snapping turtles have a bad reputation. Watch. Do you see why? My grandfather used to say, if a snapping turtle got hold of your finger, it wouldn't let go until it thundered. I don't know if that's true, but I'm certainly not going to find out. Some fishermen don't like snapping turtles because they eat baby fish. Other people don't like them because they sometimes catch and eat baby ducks. I wonder if people who feel this way ever stop to think about all the things that can happen to baby snappers. Or think about how the snapper lives the same way we do, by eating. Now let's review what we have found out about turtles today. First of all, they belong to a group of animals called reptiles. The skin of a turtle is dry and scaly. The turtle is the only four-legged animal that has a shell. A turtle is born from an egg. Good. Well, now, that's all today about turtles. Next time, we're going to learn about snakes. See you then. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Next on Mystery. They're going to get you because of that bloody car. And they can plant evidence. <laughs> Thank you.
Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Supported public television, WSKG TV Binghamton. is an eastern indigo snake. Indigo is a dark blue color. The snake got its name because of its dark blue color. Eastern indigo snakes come from a place that has a warmer climate than the one here at Squam Lake. This one comes from Florida. Maybe you've seen one of these snakes before at a circus or a carnival sideshow. The eastern indigo snake is popular with snake charmers because it grows so big. This one's seven feet long. And because it is usually good-natured. Many people don't like snakes. Some people don't like them because they think they're slimy. Nod your head if you think that's true. Guess what? My hands aren't slimy. They're dry. Let's stop and think for a minute. What kind of animal is a snake? It belongs to a group of animals called what? The word starts with R. Reptile, that's right. And like all reptiles, including turtles and lizards, this snake is covered with scales. One peculiar thing about snakes is that they shed their skin. This is the shed skin of a garter snake. It looks a little like tissue paper and feels like it too. But if you look closely, you can see the outline of the scales. We shed our skins all the time in little flakes. A snake sheds its skin all at once and usually in one piece. When a snake gets ready to shed its skin, it rubs its chin on something rough and peels its skin back, just like you shed your sweater. And most of the time, the snake skin ends up inside out, just like your sweater. Of course, one difference between the snake and me is that I can put my sweater back on. Once the snake sheds its skin, it's gone for good. Let's take another look at the garter snake skin. A snake even sheds the skin over its eyes. All snakes have thin scales like caps over their eyes. A snake has no eyelids. It can't close its eyes. These caps protect the eyes from injury. Our eastern indigo's eyes are cloudy. That means it's about to shed its skin. According to herpetologists, they're the scientists who study snakes and other reptiles, when the liquid between the snake's eyes and those protective caps gets cloudy, the snake can't see very well. When that happens, it usually prefers to avoid being handled. So let's put our snake away in its traveling box. Ready to go? There we go. After a snake sheds, it has a new, brighter, more colorful layer of skin underneath. And it might take anywhere from two weeks to six months before it sheds again. Did you know that some people think that snakes have an odor? Well, some snakes do. If you had smell-o-vision television in your room, you would know that garter snakes sometimes do give off an odor when they are disturbed. A garter snake and quite a few other snakes do this to make their enemies go away much as a skunk does with its odor. You've probably seen snakes flick out their tongues. A snake uses its tongue in the same way we use our noses, to sense what is around it and to find its food. 
but a snake's tongue really isn't dangerous. A lot of people don't like snakes because they bite. Well, it's true. Snakes do bite. They have teeth. Most snakes, however, have a harmless bite. But there are a few snakes that are poisonous. These snakes not only have teeth, they have fangs. Can you think of a snake that has fangs? This is one. A rattlesnake. Or, to be more exact, the skull of a rattlesnake. The fangs are hollow teeth that are connected to a poison sac right about here. The fangs are folded back right now, but they can move forward when the rattlesnake attacks. When the rattlesnake bites, the poison, which is called venom, can get into your bloodstream. If you should ever be bitten by a poisonous snake, get emergency help right away, because such a bite is very serious. Every year, some people die from snake bite. When people think of snakes, they very often think only of the poisonous ones. As a matter of fact, most snakes are not poisonous. All snakes are helpful. They eat the insects that destroy our gardens and the rats and mice that destroy our crops. How is it possible for a snake even a big one, like the eastern indigo, to catch and eat a large rat. Feel your jaw. Feel how it's hinged right here. A snake's jaw is different. When a snake opens its mouth, muscles at the back of its jaw stretch, and its jaw drops open, front and back. A snake has a big mouth. A snake doesn't chew its food. It swallows it whole. The strong juices in a snake's stomach digest even the bones. One of the hardest things to understand is how a snake moves. It can twist and turn and kink its body like this, and it can also go forward like this. But a snake can't go forwards and backwards the way you and I and other animals do. Why not? Because it doesn't have any legs or feet. Let's just say that to move, a snake wiggles from side to side. One thing that helps it wiggle is its long backbone. You have 26 little bones in your backbone or spine. Can you feel some of them? Well, snakes have many more than 26. For instance, this garter snake has over 200, including its tailbone. Each pair of rib bones is attached to the snake's spine. The muscles attached to the snake's ribs make it possible for the snake to move. It's time to let our garter snake go. So let's take it outside and watch it use its bones and muscles while it moves away. Remember we said that a turtle is different from every other reptile because it has what? A shell, right. Well, a snake is different from every other reptile because of something it doesn't have. And what's that? Legs, of course. A snake doesn't have any feet, but it does have something that helps it move forward. It has some stiff scales on its underside called scoots. These scoots are loose at one end and dig into the ground. It makes it possible for the snake to move forward over the ground. The scoots remind me of the tread on a bulldozer. I'll show you what I mean. Watch. The tread on the bulldozer digs into the ground and helps the bulldozer to move forward. It's 
Now I'll let the snake go. I wonder where it's going. Maybe it's going to find its home. Where do snakes live, anyway? Well, they live in hollow logs, under piles of rocks, in stone walls, under buildings, and in burrows or holes or nests that used to belong to some other animal. Each of these places may be a home to a snake. Or maybe our snake has gone to find a warm rock someplace where it can curl up in the sun. Snakes, like all reptiles, are cold-blooded. That means they do not produce their own body heat the way warm-blooded animals like humans do. They need the right body temperature to stay alive. Mostly, they get their heat from the sun. When the sun is too hot, they hide away in a cool place. When the weather is too cold, they find a warm place. Maybe our garter snake is looking for something to eat. What does a garter snake eat? Well, earthworms, toads, frogs, tadpoles, insects, spiders, any small living thing. And what eats a garter snake? Hawks, owls, crows, snapping turtles, other snakes do too. All of these may catch and eat a snake sometimes. A garter snake has many enemies. But do you know who kills snakes but doesn't eat them? We do. Some people kill snakes because they are afraid of them. And people sometimes kill snakes and other animals without knowing it. Snakes lose their habitats when people build houses and superhighways. Also, snakes die when ponds become polluted and poison is spread in gardens to kill insects or rats or mice. A snake has a hard time staying alive. Where do you think our snake went? Well, when the weather gets colder in this part of the country, a snake looks for a place to hibernate, like a cave or a burrow deep underground. There's something else interesting about garter snakes. Turtles and many snakes give birth to their young by laying eggs. For instance, here are some milk snake's eggs. One of them even has a baby snake still inside, but it is not alive. But you'll never see a garter snake's egg. Why not? Because baby garter snakes are born alive from their mother's body. Baby rattlesnakes are too. They come out of their mother's body, all ready to crawl off and take care of themselves. Now, let's see what we found out about snakes today. Snakes, like turtles, belong to a group of animals called reptiles. Snakes are able to shed their skin. Snakes don't have feet. Instead, they are helped to move about by special stiff scales called scoots. Mm -hmm. Poisonous snakes have special teeth called fangs. Very good. Don't you agree that snakes are really very interesting animals? Why don't you pretend that you are a herpetologist and see what else you can find out about snakes? Do they drink water? Do they sleep? How long do they live? Good luck. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.
Tonight at 8 o'clock, Nova takes a look at the hidden messages picked up by our sense of smell on what smells. Then at 9, Frontline examines how the revolution is failing in Cuba on the last communist. And stay tuned at 10 as that delicate balance to our Bill of Rights examines the First Amendment and hate speech in <laughs> Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Viewer supported public television, WSKG TV Binghamton. sound, you know it must be spring. There's a lot of bird talk around here today. I hear chickadees calling their name, chickadee dee dee. And there's some jays scolding each other, jay, jay. And even the crows have something to say. Suddenly birds seem to be everywhere. Did you ever hold a live bird in your hands? If you have, then you know that a living bird feels soft, and warm. It isn't often you have a chance to get this close to a bird, but this pigeon doesn't mind because he's been handled before. What do you know about this bird and other birds? In what ways are our pigeon and other birds alike? Let's begin to find out. Anytime you have a chance to get this close to a bird, look at it really carefully. Notice what size it is. Notice what color or colors its feathers are. Take a look at the shape of its head and the shape of its body. And then pay attention to the beak. Is it pointed like the pigeons? Or is it round like a duck's? Or hooked like a hawk's? And what about its eyes? Are they at the front of the head like yours and mine? Or are they on the side of the head? like the pigeons. Oh, yes. And what about the feet? How many toes does a bird have? Four, that's right. And most birds that perch, like the pigeon, have three toes in front and one toe in back. Easy, easy. Where do you usually find birds? Well, you can find pigeons almost anywhere. But to find other birds, you usually have to go to where they live. For example, you have to go to the woods to find this bird, the great horned owl. This is a tame female named Hootie, and I almost miss seeing her because she blends in so well with this dead tree trunk here. What's the first thing you notice when you look at Hootie? What strikes you the most? She's big, yes. Owls are, this owl's a very big bird. And what else? She has a very interesting face. What sort of pattern do her feathers on her face grow in? Look around her eyes. What do you see? What sort of pattern? Yes, circles. The feathers around her eyes grow in circles called facial discs. All owls have facial discs and big staring eyes. That's how we know they're owls. And unlike the pigeon, which had eyes on the side of its head, the owl has both eyes at the front of its face, just like you and I do. That's a help. She can not only see me with both eyes at the same time, she can also see a small moving animal and be able to judge how far away it is. 
all birds can't do that. Maybe you've noticed how some birds cock their head to one side when they look at you. What are those things sticking up on top of her head? No, they're not horns. No, they're not ears either. They're just tufts of feathers. But the owl does have ears. All birds have ears. The pigeon has ears which are openings in the side of its head, hidden under the feathers. The owl has ears under her facial disc, right about here on her face. And these opening slits really are big ears. If our ears were as big on our head as the owl's are on hers, why our ears would be hanging down to our elbows. Big ears are a help to an owl because they help it to find its food when hunting for dinner at night. Notice the beak. What shape would you say it was? It's a hooked beak. Maybe you'll hear it clattering together later on. It's useful for tearing apart her food. It's the owl's knife and fork. Now notice the owl's feet. They're covered with feathers. The pigeons aren't, but owls do have feathered feet. Why do you think I'm putting this leather glove on? <laughs> That's right, because I'm going to pick up Hooty. And if you look at those toenails or talons, you'll see that they're very sharp and they could cut into my arm if I don't. feathers and the tail and the wings, what are they used for? Of course, flying. Those are her, called her flight feathers. What other uses do feathers have for a bird? Can you tell me? Yes, they protect the skin from getting cut against bushes and things. They keep the skin w dry so it doesn't get wet. And what else? That's right, feathers keep a bird warm. Underneath the outer layer of feathers, are some soft, fluffy feathers, like this. I can hardly feel it, it's so, so light. These are called down feathers, and they do the same thing for the bird that, they, that my down vest does for me. They trap a layer of air right close to our body that helps to keep us warm. In fact, birds' bodies are warmer than all other animals. Feathers also help to keep a bird cool when it's hot, the bird just draws in its feathers very tightly, and that helps to squeeze out that layer of trapped warm air. Oh, look, Hooty is getting overheated and breathing fast to cool off. Birds, you know, don't sweat. When they're too warm, they pant like this. Now, why don't we give Hooty a chance to show us what these flight feathers are for? Let's go do it. is what makes a bird a bird. Not all birds can fly, but all birds do have feathers. This is a flight feather. The main part of the feather, veins, are held together by tiny hooks called barbs. What do you think happens when the barbs become unzipped like this? That's right, the bird has trouble flying because air passes right through that flight feather. But what can the bird do? Pass the feather through its beak and zip the teeth on the barbs together again. And that's what it does. What have we learned so far? Well, we've learned that birds have a body covering of feathers. They're warm. They have beaks and feet for getting food. 
and they have wings, although not all birds fly. There's one more way that birds are alike. And here's a clue. What do you think this blue thing is? That's right. It's an egg from which a baby robin hatched. All mother birds lay eggs that baby birds hatch out of. Most mother birds lay their eggs in nests. They build their nests in very different places. I once heard about a sparrow who built her nest in an air conditioner. Let's look around and see if we can find some nests around here. This apple tree may be where the robin's egg came from. And look up there. It's the nest of an oriole. The oriole mother bird makes one of the neatest and prettiest of all nests. She weaves her nest from plant fibers and strings and hangs it on a limb high above the ground. Here's a nest in a dead tree. Woodpeckers build their nests in holes in trees. This nest probably belongs to a woodpecker. You can tell the size of a bird by the size of the nest it makes and the size of the eggs it lays in the nest. This sparrow seems to have found some string to add to her nest. I'll be careful not to touch the nest. We've been looking at nests of birds who build in the field or in the forest. Now let's explore a wetland area and see a bird that nests there. I don't know if the great blue herons have laid their eggs yet, but I do know where there are some building their nests over on the other side of the lake. Oh, look. There go two loons. The place we're going to is called a rookery. That's a place where large birds build their nests and raise their young. What we're looking for are some big nests, loosely made of sticks, built high in the trees. We're in luck. Look at all those nests. The great blue herons, you see, roost in flocks. Look at the size of that nest. We must be very quiet here. We don't want to scare the adult birds away. Whatever you do, never disturb a bird's nest during nesting season. The mother might fly away and the young birds would die. Now, Let's see what we have learned so far. Why don't you help me? All birds have feathers, right? Most birds can fly. All birds have beaks and feet for gathering their food. Mm -hmm. All birds lay eggs. Most birds lay their eggs in nests. Good for you. There's a lot more that you can learn about birds, and there are a lot more birds that you can learn things about. Why don't you become a bird detective and see how many different kinds of birds you can find in your neighborhood? See how much you can learn about them. It might become a lifetime hobby. Who knows? This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Animals, A to Z. Today's letter is W.